Hi, Yomi. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to just give a couple more minutes to let people log on. No worries. Can, um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. We'll get going in just a second here. I just want to give Professor Backman a chance to log on. Thanks, Ben. Sure thing.
Okay, thanks for your patience, everybody. We're gonna get the ball rolling here. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hopefully this is gonna be an interesting presentation for everybody. And you'll have some questions that our folks can answer. Um, so as you all know, topic today is the day in the life of a data scientist. We're gonna talk a little bit about the collaboration between Center for Physical Genomics and Engineering at Northwestern and Worldwide Technology. Um, kind of two different organizations collaborating, collaborating in a pretty interesting way, I think. So to get started, um, we're going to have a short kind of overview of each of the organizations that are involved. Um, Yoni Malki from WWT will talk about what they do. And the director of CPGE at Northwestern, Professor Vadim Backman, will give you just some brief context on uh, what our mission is. And then we'll have um, the people who are actually doing the collaboration um, talk about sort of how they interface and what their day in their life is like. Um, so I think without further ado, if um, you want to share our first slides, I can um, change over. So Yoni, if you want to take it from here, I'll stop sharing my screen and we can get rolling. I think you're uh, you're muted, Yoni. Hey, uh, I got I got the slides up. Can you guys can you guys see this screen or yeah. yes? You got to flip okay. it. You're on presentation mode. Top display settings. There we go. There we go. You're uh, you're muted again, Yoni. I think he's rejoining. There we go. Now he's back. How about now? Now we got you. Okay. Odd. Okay. Anyway, uh, nice to meet you, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to talk today. Uh, we're going to give you a little bit of a quick overview on Worldwide and the R&D program just to get started before we talk about what it's like to be a data scientist. And I think a lot of the reason why we want to give this overview is because, um, you know, I, I Worldwide is a, um, a consulting organization where we go in and we work with different companies on in a project-based way which uh, the data scientist role um, is, is, could be a, a little bit different than if you were to go in as a data scientist at, at a big bank or a big you know, internet company or something like that. So I wanted to give a little context on that so that when, when we start talking about a day in the life of a data scientist, from our perspective, you know where we're coming from. So worldwide, just quickly, uh, probably one of the biggest companies that no one's ever heard of. Uh, it's 13 billion in revenue last year. It's one of the it's the largest African American owned technology company in the United States. Started in 1990, um, the same two owners, Jim and Dave, uh, still own the company. So it's privately held. Uh, more than 7,000 employees, and we we've con consistently over the years been ranked one of the best companies to work for. Jim and Dave and the rest of the leadership team spend. Uh, a, an immense amount of time focused on culture. And it's not just the beer and ping pong table type of culture. It's they really care about their people and, and what they're doing. Um, just something quickly to note also is that most of this revenue came uh, originally from reselling uh, IT infrastructure. But over the last 10 years, they've really tried to move into more of a strategic services type of organization, providing consulting work and consulting services like we'll talk about today um, in different areas like AI and cloud, et cetera. And that's the, that's the group that you're talking to today, consulting services, specifically the AI area. All right, so let's keep going. So uh, Jason and I will introduce ourselves quickly here. Uh, so I'm managing director on the business analytics advisors team. 
Uh, I got my PhD in mechanical engineering back in oh, 2007, 2008 from Penn State. And, and I went straight into the aerospace industry after that and, and did what I learned at, at school uh, for about four years. I really wanted a career change after that. Um, I loved being in the, in the rocket industry, but I felt like there was just so much so many more different things in, in the business world and getting into consulting just really intrigued me. And so I ended up um, switching careers, getting into a company called Opera Solutions, which was a management consulting firm that focused on data science for customers. They were one of the first movers there. Jason came from there as well. And when I got the offer there, you know, because of my background, I got an offer to either be a data scientist or go on the consulting side. I chose to do consulting um, mainly because I, I liked being in front of the customer. I liked managing a team of, of consultants and data scientists and thinking through the business problem as well as the data science problem. Uh, whereas data scientists typically, typically get uh, very much into the, into the weeds on what, what data is presented to them, the business problem as well, but, but more so on the model build and productionization of the model. So um, I came from Opera over to Worldwide, uh, took a two-year hiatus and went to JP Morgan for a couple of years in-house and then missed the consulting world, missed Worldwide and came back. And I've been back at Worldwide now for about four. Uh, Jason, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me all right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So my name is Jason Liu. My background is in theoretical physics and I actually did uh, two postdoc, one in University of Maryland, the other one in University of Arizona. I got my PhD from Stanford. And uh, yeah, so after, after hanging in academia for too long, then I realized I really wanted to solve real life uh, problems out there. So that's how I switched into uh, analytics, okay, and data science. And I have been doing some sort of, I was in New York City for a short time and uh, did some insurance um, kind of uh, portfolio analysis. And then I work in JD Power and Associate for, uh, in automotive marketing analysis and um, FICO for credit card fraud detection. And at the end, I joined uh, Opera Solution where, you know, the same company where Yoni came from. And uh, then I started in Worldwide Technology about uh, six, uh, seven years ago. And then I have been in Worldwide ever since. Yes, it's a, has, Worldwide has a great culture. Yeah, that's why I, I'm staying here. And uh, we, we solve uh, business problems. We apply AI and the machine learning. Uh, to build uh, analytics models uh, to help our, our clients solve uh, business problems. And the team has been expanding, uh, expanding quite a bit. Okay? And the one great thing that attracts uh, our candidates is we have the AI R&D program, uh, which uh, Yoni is heading. And uh, we will talk a little bit about it uh, later in, in another slide. Yep. Great, thanks, Jason. So uh, just a little bit about consulting in general and how Worldwide sets up the consulting services organization. So as I mentioned, um, it's it's a little different than being in-house at a JP Morgan or, or an internet company or something along those lines. We work in project-based types of um, type of engagements. Uh, and when we when we go into a customer, we've got to form a team that will be the best team to solve the, the challenge that is provided to us that we're trying to get in there for. And that's, that's typically a mix of management consultants, data scientists, uh, machine learning platform engineers, software delivery, and multi-cloud uh, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, customers' problems. They've, they're often moving to the cloud or leveraging um, on-premise uh, GPUs and thinking through what, what they want to solve um, and ultimately turning it into to a model. And a lot of our customers are anywhere on the, I mean, the customers can be anywhere on our data maturity curve. They can be, you know, they don't really have a data science team and they're looking to get started. They want to understand what the value of data science is. We help them build their first couple of models. We're also working with a very mature company where they've been building models for years and they use them in production, but their processes and, and way of working are, is, is, are not optimized. And we help them through a, through a concept called machine learning operations, ML ops, 
to, to optimize and streamline their data science process. So it could be from anywhere across uh, the landscape of, of areas and, and lots of different challenges. But key point here is projects usually last around 12 to 16 weeks in the first couple phases. And then we hope to get like multi-year uh, <laughs> deals with, with, uh, with organizations, but that you know doesn't happen that often. Um, and when we go in, we try to bring the right mix of people uh, to, in order to make sure that we get in, understand the problem at hand and solve what they're looking for, create a story, and then ultimately expand into different areas within that customer. And feel free to ask any questions while we're going along here, if you have any. Um, here's just a, a, a menu, if you will, of, of our offerings uh, in the machine learning and data space. As you can see, it's not, it's not all about ML and analytics and AI. When we get into customers, that's typically the part that makes their eyes light up. But if you want to do this at scale, you've got to be able to have the right data platforms in place. And so we help with designing platforms and, and, and uh, configuring, et cetera, usually in the cloud. We'll, we'll help with data architecture and data pipelines, uh, data governance, um, and sometimes even getting out into the product strategy space for how these AI models are gonna be integrated into an actual application. And then, as I mentioned before at the top there, scalable ML is more about machine learning operations to, to allow organizations to take their models that they're building and have a more streamlined way, a single pane of glass to monitor and assess their models and then refresh them. All right, so the AI R&D program, I'm gonna end this up back off to Jason. Jason, if you wanna walk through the evolution yeah. of the R&D program and what we're doing there, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, so we started by doing a lot of uh, R&D on the ML side at the beginning, but uh, very quickly we realized there is a new field uh, picking up, which is in the area of uh, deep learning. So in fact, uh, we started to realize that uh, uh, we need to partner up with uh, NVIDIA. And so we, around like, uh, that's around 2017, 2018 frame. Uh, we started uh, to formalize our AI R&D effort in uh, adding in some structure and formality behind the research project. Before it was just data scientists, you know, proposing research topics ad hoc, okay? And then we supported uh, their effort. And uh, starting from like uh, 2017 and end of 17, beginning of uh, 18, we formalized the entire process. And we have uh, established um, project uh, pipeline in we would uh, have a committee of people uh, picking up what R&D project we want to do next. In, at the same time, we started collaboration with uh, the NVIDIA people. We started to participate in their uh, annual GPU tech conferences. He, he, then the program kept expanding. At the beginning, it was just confined to data science. Uh, throughout the year, uh, like uh, 2019, we started to involve other parts of the company, including engineer engineers, okay, and the other other areas of the uh, company. Uh, we augmented the. Uh, our uh, R&D effort by collaborating with our outside institutions, in particular Northwestern University, the Backman Lab, okay? and uh, we we expanded in in all areas, not just uh, image recognition, video analytics. We also did a lot of NLP text analytics. In the, now the latest uh, project we are doing is uh, actually one of the project we did was in bias in AI. So we also dived into other impacts or consequences of AI. And we are continuing to expand our effort and uh, diversifying our um, research portfolio. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, in this effort actually it uh, goes around in a full circle. Whenever we learn about something that our customer care, then we will schedule, okay, plan for some research in that area. And the purpose is like, uh, we want to stand out among our competitions. So we want to have a cutting edge and we want to do things before our competitors, competitors do. So we want to keep our competitive edge over other uh, analytics companies. And once we do the uh, 
the research, then our recommendation are held to a higher standard. You know. uh, the purpose of that is to become a thought leadership in the area of uh, AI ML. And with that, once we establish, we typically publish um, white papers. You, you guys can visit our R&D, AI R&D website, web pages, and you can find all our white papers published there. And uh, we, with that, we establish our reputation so we can approach the CEOs, okay, or C-suite, CIO, CEO, CTOs of our client companies, and then in turn, they they will bring up uh, their needs or what they, they they are seeing out there in the market uh, or their specific needs and that will give us idea on what other areas we want to do further AI R and D. Mm -hmm. So it's a full cycle. Very uh, this model has worked out really successfully and uh, we are still expanding. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the the only other thing I'll add to this is that. Um, you know, we like that Wayne Gretzky quote, we want to skate to where the puck's going to be. A lot of the work that we do for our customers is, is, is pretty, you know, interesting work and it's, it could be cutting edge, uh, but we get kind of immersed with that project and the way that that company works. And we've got to sometimes deal with all of the roadblocks and bureaucracy that comes with, with organizations. And so this R&D program allows the data science and the engineering team to step away from that, think about things that our customers may not be thinking about right now that they, we think we'll be thinking about in the next couple of years and get our hands on it so that when they do ask, we're able to point to some white papers or talk to some of the projects that we've done. But the other thing I'll say is that the R&D program is not uh, necessarily, it's not its own entity. This is something that we have rotations for people that could be on projects or are on the bench and they come in and, and work on it um, as part of you know the, the way the organization works, but we're not an R and D program like IBM, you know, who spends billions of dollars doing R and D. Uh, that's not the intent of this. It's a little yeah. Bit so uh, the way how we operate is we reserve about ten percent in a year of our data science time. Each person get to spend the ten percent of their time to do R and D work, so they can pick up uh, new skills. Okay, or you know, advanced tools or algorithms. It's a way to keep our data scientist skill set uh, up to date. And another comment is um, uh, sometimes we do derive um, offerings or solutions that uh, we can present to our clients. So it help us to uh, do business development with our clients as well. Yeah. Um, is this all? Yeah. Hi, buddy. Great. So maybe if you don't mind, I'll just say a few, a few words about uh, the Center for Physical Genomics and Engineering. Uh, one of the co-sponsors of this uh, day in the uh, life of uh, data scientist uh, workshop. Uh, CPG is a natural uh, collaborator I think of WWC in this uh, in this realm. Uh, CPG is involved in the development of fundamental understanding of the principles of physical genomics or understanding genomic processes from the uh, perspective of physical science sciences, and uh, taking this principles all the way to uh, translational uh, in, uh, projects related to diagnostics and uh, therapeutics of diseases such as cancer through uh, engineering of uh, chromatin structure and the genome structure. There are 16 faculty members, uh, primarily from Northwestern, but also from other uh, top places. And what's important, that's something that is relevant to WWT and the data science approaches is that, uh, the core, the heart of the of the Center for Physical Genomics is in physical sciences, engineering, and computational sciences. Uh, the underlying technological platform, which permeates pretty much everything else that the center does, uh, includes uh, computational genomics, uh, development of new 
high resolution, super resolution imaging, nanoscale imaging technologies, um, and uh, molecular modeling at a uh, uh, in the multi uh, multi dimensional uh, in a multi length scale context. As you can imagine, every one of those core uh, technologies is grounded in data analysis, including data sciences. So the feeling uh, of a lot of people affiliated with the center is that data sciences will continue to grow in in their impact on the underlying uh, technological platform involved in physical genomics, but also, uh, and equally importantly, in the uh, in translation of those principles to, for example, uh, disease diagnosis such as uh, such as cancer. And it's one thing that I uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, the development of collaboration between WWT and Northwestern uh, in in that domain. Um, so I, I also wanted to use this opportunity to just welcome everybody uh, to this workshop uh, from the uh, Northwestern uh, Northwestern side. And uh, with that, I think we have a very good, tra perfect transition uh, uh, for a, a few more uh, people to talk to, including uh, uh, Jessica Lee uh, and uh, Jason from WWC. And you will also hear from a couple of uh, Northwestern investigators uh, later today. Um, thank you. Thanks, Tareem. I think it's been a while. So just a disclaimer, Jessica has always been my English name. So this is the time I have the chance to use it. But feel free to call Jessica or Yue because it still like ticks a little bit when William says Jessica. I'm like, I'm so used to Yui. <laughs> By the way, it's, it's a really then, pleasure to have you uh, to have you back and uh, present uh, and speak to this audience, albeit virtually. Uh, really wonderful to have you to see you over Zoom. <laughs> I think I think since I, I, I know most people are fully vaccinated, hopefully we can see each other in person pretty soon and. Uh, just a refresher, if you have forgotten about me, here is me. I was born and raised in China and I did my undergrad in Shanghai Jiao Tong University in material science. I did my, I had a wonderful PhD with William in Northwestern. I'm actually in applied physics. And then I worked pretty much on using electron microscopy to characterize chromatin 3D structure at nanoscale and try to infer the form function relationship. Try to build the bridge between the chromatin conformation and the following um, chemical processes, biological processes, including cancer formation. So I graduated in 2019, and then I joined worldwide as a data scientist and till this day. So I would love to share my experience with this good company with uh, the fellow lab mates and other people attend this call. Um, so can we go to the next slide? So working in data science and machine learning. I mean, I know like data science has been rated like the sexist job in the new century, but it, it's always like a, like a mystery of what exactly is data science and machine learning. So a lot of different perspectives have different concept of what data science is. So the society think I'm probably ruling an army of robots. And my, my friends probably think I'm like this weird geeky professor, like just love the robot. And my parents think I'm probably running a big frame in the data centers like uh, Amazon, uh, AWS, Microsoft, all that. And other programmers like software engineers, data engineers, they probably think I'm just a math geek. I'm just trying to derive equations to actually find the optimal solution for a loss function. And to myself, I think I'm doing fancy optimization problem. Hopefully it's convex. If it's not, put some constraints to make it convex. But eventually uh, day to day as a joke, I'm mostly using the existing libraries and then try to make things work and solve some problem. But that being said, as a joke, let's see what exactly I'm doing on a daily basis in worldwide. So I think in uh, shorter than 10 words about data science project in consulting is more like a data-driven solutions to high complexity problems in many different industries. So there are three types of modeling that I'm mostly familiar with, but this is just a short list of all the things that the team do. So the first one, uh, you may or may not be very aware of all of the modeling, so I'm gonna go through them one by one. So the first large genre of data science modeling is the sequence model, which includes time series. 
if things happen in time, you cannot reverse or time travel. And the second one is actually natural language processing. If you think of the particular word or articulation we have, they also come in sequence. If you reverse it, it may or may not work. And then the last one is predictive modeling because we want to do something in the future. Again, cannot defy the law of physics, don't travel back in time. The projects related to this specific type of sequence modeling is more like we can predict daily sales. An example of a project I've worked directly with is an industry leader in retail. So they came to Worldwide and would like us to give them a pricing model uh, or actually like sales model prediction on a daily basis such that they can staff their storefront more efficiently without sacrificing the margin or the employee satisfaction. So in this case, we actually deploy um, XG Boost and try to create a, a predictive modeling to project daily sales seven days ahead and then try to make it as accurate as possible. And then the second big genre of learning is a little bit different from statistical learning standpoint. It's more like a reinforcement learning. So the techniques involved is Q learning plus deep learning. So people give it a very uh, innovative name, deep Q learning. So using deep Q learning is actually an in-house R&D project that the team come up with to train a reinforcement learning agent to find the best route to direct traffic. And then here, the traffic has broader meanings than just like traffic on the road. Think of it as physical and virtual at the same time. So the physical traffic, it could be like a congestion on the road, try to find the best route for some trucks to go through and haul some goods. And the virtual traffic, you can think about a router trying to direct internet traffic so that you don't have congestion. And, and for example, this Zoom call is a perfect example. Something happened under the hood to make that when I speak, you don't have a 20 second lag. So the team actually work on this in-house and then currently we have patent pending on this innovative approach. And the last one, I think, because Vidim's lab is very heavy on the characterization of different images. So people are more familiar with this genre. That's the computer vision. So computer vision is, I would say, the crown jewel of machine learning, at least for the last decades. Lots of progress has been made there. And then the team, like Jason mentioned, is like a very good partner with NVIDIA GPU and actually got up numerous awards by that collaboration. So on the computer vision front, very relevantly, you can use it to help detect cancer from images real time with some inference. So the method that deployed in this type of uh, machine learning approach is YOLO. It's short for you only look once. It's one of the most famous algorithm out there because of high performance and uh, real-time processing power. And then the second one is also a buzzword again. It stands for generative adversarial networks. So basically the idea is you try to actually train a model using another model. So you can cut off the middleman of trying to insert your uh, own bias and objectives into the model. So in this computer vision genre, a, a project I'm working on right now is in video analytics. So what we can use computer vision is to help uh, the client try to identify high risk event just by looking at their footage such that we can, first of all, make them continue to be in production that has a lot of uh, financial impact. And second, sometimes this video analytics is life-saving as it can be deployed in COVID screening or try to even do some preventive maintenance in some heavy industry um, that if you do have an incident that usually results in very um, um, desirable consequences. So these are something I've worked on on a high level. And if we go to the next one, we can go into a slightly more detail to talk about the substance. So this is a project I've recently worked on with one of the uh, largest global bank in the world. So they came to us and would like us to build a solution so that I can automate the IT management. So what is IT management? Think about NUIT. So if something like on the internet is not working, you probably need to submit a ticket, call the NUIT people to get it fixed. So that is actually the same in pretty much all of the organizations in the world, including this bank. So what happened for them is that all of the bank services, either is like an ATM machine or like a Chase app or US bank app on your phone or some other things you have some in interaction with, it's probably supported by microservices and they have some back end calculation going on and then some devices are gonna support this operation. So when something happened to the devices, for example, a important uh, router 
that routes the data packet from the data center of the bank to your phone happen to have some problem. First, it will generate some alarming signal. And then someone is gonna look at that signal, try to make a decision whether or not this signal should be pushed into a ticket. And then a team of engineer will try to troubleshoot the ticket and recover the service. So as you can tell, like this is highly manual. Manual means two things. One is there will be delay because you cannot ex expect a human to function 100%, 24-7. Two, that means there will be inconsistency in the decision-making. Rules are rules. When it's executed, it's up for interpretation. So because of those two factors, they would like to fully automate that process. First, to cut off the manual labor. Second, to accelerate the time from device has alarm to someone actually troubleshoot the device. And third, they would like some consistency in how they actually turn all of those alarms into some workable ticket. So as part of a larger engagement with this bank, the data science team, including myself, built two models to help them solve this problem. The first one is called Smart Priority. Basically what it does is look at all of those alarms and try to give it a risk score of which one someone have to look at at real time. As the alarm coming into the queue, the model will make a prediction right off the bat. So that effectively cut down the time in between alarm to ticket by 90% and more. And then if this is some really crucial device that support a very important micro business in terms of transaction, 90% could mean billions of dollars of impact. And then the second one is to make it more uh, convenient for the engineering team to troubleshoot the, the ticket. We also come up with a um, clustering model that we actually uh, put the tickets that have similar nature likely to be caused by the same root cause into the same group. So when they do troubleshooting, it's a lot more convenient. They can get a lot of inference from this type of grouping. So that will actually cut down the time to repair by a large percentage as well. So this is one of the actual case that I work with a real client. And also I would like to talk a little bit about the R&D work. That's more like the study of the art, having fun, try to make the world a better place. So this one is the detecting bias in AI. So I would say that this bias we're talking about right now is different than the bias variance trade-off of a model. Because bias variance trade-off is a technical problem. It can be solved. The bias we're talking about here is more like a human-made problem that cannot be solved or entirely solved by the technology itself. So the bias I'm talking about here is more like due to historic reasons, there are some wrong association of people's gender, ethnicity, religious beliefs, political beliefs, et cetera, to some other attributes. For example, their chance of being a good executive, their chance of getting into a particular college. So why would the model have this bias that's created by human? Well, think about this way. Any deep learning model, machine learning model requires historic data to be trained on. If the historic data, for example, is a set of data of college admission, then the human bias is intrinsically uh, embedded into the data set. And a good model trying to mimic the human behavior as much as possible will pick up that wrong association between those two attributes. And maybe some people will be saying, that's probably okay because it's a true representation of what happened. But a problem of most natural language processing or NLP based model is that they actually amplify that bias in their prediction. And the reason is first, all of the model is just a mathematical representation of the real world using some conditional probabilities. So right now, the model seeing that one attribute, not merit-based, is tightly associated with an outcome, AKA getting admitted to this college. And the attribute is actually easier to learn than the merit. And then the model will build a strong association, try to infer whether someone is going to be admitted into a college based on the easy to learn, but not necessarily important attributes. So to debias this problem, because it's a data-based problem, we have to correct the data and then train the model on the corrected data, try to reverse this undesired bias. And also the consequence of the bias model could be just horrible because more and more times 
before you have your resume being looked at a person, it's been screened by the machine. So we want to get rid of this bias as much as possible. And how do we actually quantify if something is biased? Uh, can we go back just one sec? Uh, thanks. Is that there are metrics to try to see if your model is biased? So the first one is called bias amplification or called BA. And the second one is called difference in quality of opportunity or DEO. So think of this as a conditional probability. If you have a protected attribute, for example, your gender, and then you have a target attribute, for example, your capability of being an executive, then what we're trying to uh, deep, deep decouple is that given you are a female, can you infer your capability of being an executive? You can't because they should not be associated. And then this is exactly what um, the research is trying to do. So uh, the bias amplification is that given the ground truth, for example, there are 20% female in high executive in reality, can we have a model that also has about 20% in the predictive uh, consequences? And then the difference in quality of opportunity means if the model made a mistake, for example, um, someone is likely to commit a different crime on the second time. If the true statistic says about 10% of African-American, the model should predict like at least equal opportunity across different genders when they make a mistake. So I'm gonna pause here, any questions before I go on? I know like conditional probability sometimes is a little bit hard to actually think through. Okay, good. Vadim has really good students. <laughs> Can we go to the next page, please? So to actually do this, because like I mentioned, it's a data problem that you have highly biased data that the model try to correlate the attributes with one another, just purely based on statistics and amplify it. To troubleshoot this, we need to actually correct the data. So that means we need to synthesize a fake data set but also as realistic as possible without any of this um, desired correlations. So actually in natural language processing, one thing that we can do is we can try to train a generative adversarial network model and then try to actually decouple specific attributes with the desired attributes in their latent space. So if you think everything as like presented in a vector space, what you can do is you can try to just get rid of the component that's projected onto, for example, gender direction or race direction, but keep everything else is the same. Feed the downstream model with this type of uh, synthetic data, and hopefully the model can learn that these two attributes are not actually associated. And then that's like the general idea of behind this more complicated model. So what happened eventually is that we actually have a model that generates different tweets and tweets can be biased. We have another model that looking at these tweets, try to identify whether or not the tweet owner could be of specific ethnicity. We have a third model that try to give feedback of the gen tweet generation model that if you generate something that the other model can easily tell the ethnicity, please try again until we reach convergence. Then we, at the end of the day, what we have is a model that can generate very realistic tweets, but you can't tell the, tell the ethnicity. And then we use this synthetic data to train a downstream classifier that looking at the tweets, can you predict some other attributes? And then by looking at the results, I think in all fronts, we're actually seeing a pretty good improvement, even though we, uh, we mixed the synthetic data with the real data at different ratio. So this is just as a PLC, but I hope this can uh, be actually applied to real world problems. The implication could be in uh, justice system, it could be in college admission, it could be in health insurance underwriter. So just in general, try to get the machine up to date with our progress in uh, our recognition of human race. So uh, if we go to the next one, this will be uh, probably my favorite slide to talk about is the professional development opportunities in worldwide. So I've been with Worldwide for a year and two months now, and I think I've learned so much in the team. So there are three aspects of the learning opportunities within this team. And I think the most important one is learn on the job. So 
before I came to Worldwide, I was doing a lot of uh, microscopy. I don't have enough exposure in doing like data science, actually write thousands of lines of code and actually have it in production, which is a completely different story. But uh, I think luckily I got a lot of support from the team and the team members to actually pick up the skills on the job itself. I'm staffing on something, I'm gonna pick it up. And I feel like this is something very unique when you have a higher education degree because you gain the ability to critical think and then you can pretty much learn anything if you give it enough time and some guidance, you can figure it out. So I think that's great. And then the second one is the R&D project. The R&D project is a unique opportunity for you to do pretty much whatever you want, given a very broad problem. For example, debiasing AI, that's like a, that's almost as difficult as can we detect cancer early? So in the R&D program, I have a lot of freedom to choose the model I would like to use. And then uh, we come up with something that's really state of the art. You can't even find many things in literature and we're going to publish a white paper on it as well. And then the last bit is the learning resources. I think what's really nice about Worldwide is provide a lot of free online and on request learning, uh, particularly for data science. So currently the team has free licenses for Udemy, Data to Camp, O'Reilly, and as well as the industrial standard of things tools, tool sets that it's good to know as a data scientist. So we can get on request training on AWS, Azure, which is the Microsoft version of the cloud, and then the Google version, of course, and then some other like names that's very common in the industry. Uh, a, a, a very good mix of exposure to many different things. All right, cool. Hi, um, so thank you, Yue. Good to see you um, back in the um, meeting. Um, so since I want to respect everyone's time, we are pretty short on time. So um, to give a brief introduction, um, I'm a PhD student at, at BME department at Backman Lab. Uh, I had the uh, wonderful privilege to uh, collaboratively work with um, World War Technology. Um, my background was in engineering and some years in medicine, so I got to learn a lot um, in the AI aspect, how people were um, taking different approaches to uh, problem solving and um, contributing to the group effort. Um, so to talk about the project, we collaborated with the um, WW team. I wish to go briefly on the data we worked on. It is a project that was based on PWS images collected from clinical samples, um, specifically buccal cells from lung cancer patients. Uh, I wanted to give some background into the PWS um, imaging, how it works, but since we're short on time, I want to just briefly mentioned that it is capable of quantifying statistical properties um, of a cell structure at a nanoscale level. So how it works is um, it's uh, based on this theorem, uh, mesoscopic light transfer theorem. I'm not gonna go into it, but what it basically says is uh, multiple interference of light waves reflected um, and traveled in a weakly scattering medium is sensitive to refractive index fluctuations um, at a subdiffractional level. So, um, with these fluctuations in the um, uh, in the in the refractive index, then it suggests the um, uh, physical biophysical structure um, of the inner cell. So, the spatial variation. Uh, within a cell, or we are more interested in the with what's within the nucleus. Um, so the biophysical aspects of how chromatin are structured, um, those uh, give rise to the spatial mass density fluctuations in terms of the refractive index fluctuations. So in one word, our PW system is sensitive to uh, mass uh, density fluctuations at a subdiffraction no level, um, uh, nanoscale level. So can you go to the next slide? Um, so what we have done in the past um, was the clinicians would gather buckle swaps from the clinic, immerse them in 25% ethanol, 
uh, ship it to us in a temperature control manner. Uh, we would collect those, deposit it using a spraying deposition device, fix them in 95%, and we would have them um, imaged with our PWS system. And from the sample collected, we would get about um, 40 to 50 cells per patient. And how we traditionally did this um, is we would get their PD of a signal from the nucleus and we would average them to give a single number per of the nucleus uh, PD of a signal or biomarker uh, per patient. So one patient would have one number. And based on what we were interested, uh, for example, we may be interested in seeing if PD of is sensitive to non cancerous versus early stage cancer. Um, uh, groups, uh, we will put them into a separate category and fit a, a regression model uh, and other statistical methods to it. So although our results were great, uh, we did um, they did have room for improvement and we believe that um, these different more sophisticated approaches using AI uh, based algorithms may help our, us better differentiate um, or categorize um, these group of cells, whether they pose a high risk, low risk of later developing into a cancer or not. Um, so that's a brief introduction on what we did so far, and Shravya is going to be talking on what AI methods we tried out and what collaborative um, efforts we did. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so let me just quickly introduce myself. Um, I'm Shravya. I've been part of the lab um, as a research associate for about a couple of years now, and my contributions are primarily using machine learning slash deep learning for PWS. Uh, my background is in electrical engineering, uh, focusing more on signal processing and machine learning. Uh, before joining the lab, I worked as a deep learning research engineer in the field of histopathology for cancer detection, and also briefly as a data scientist um, and worked on some really cool um, computer vision and NLP projects in the e-commerce space. Pretty much mostly did whatever Jessica mentioned in her slide um, of importing. SVM. <laughs> but um, on a more serious note, I think working on the PWS research, it has been very enjoyable, <clears throat> mostly because of the complexity of the problem itself. And like there's this huge, vast amount of information that is for us to understand and discover. So as Andrew mentioned, the process itself of data acquisition and the theory behind the PWS is very uh, carefully crafted and, you know, associating it with the underlying chromatin structures and talking about cancer. Uh, this is what makes it really, you know, a difficult problem to solve and very exciting as well. So traditionally what has been going on is we use the raw spectral data. We do a bunch of statistical and signal analysis, and then we have, uh, you know, arrived at this very beautifully diagnostic marker of sigma, which we were able to use to uh, distinguish between controls and cancers. Um, but we wanted to kick it up a notch, and I think the objectives around using AI fit perfectly with our problem. That is, we want to make it. Uh, you know, obviously we want to work it more, make it work more efficiently. And also, you know, it has to be reproducible and robust enough, but more importantly, it's also to understand the functioning of the theory itself in, in the ways that we do not understand right now. So I think that is where we try to incorporate using uh, machine learning or deep learning models, um, very basic like a CNN itself, um, in using the whole map of sigma rather than just using the average uh, doubt value. And it has proven to give out like considerably better results. Um, and I think here is where our collaboration with WWT has, uh, you know, it, it came in and we were really glad that the team of, you know, data scientists that we have collaborated with helped us understand. So if you could go to the next slide, please, yes. Um, thank you. So um, we wanted to take a look further away from just using these markers of sigma and look into the raw image cube, which is the original data itself, um, because we wanted to understand more things that are happening in the natural form of the data itself. Um, you know, a few of the initial ways in which the collaboration started out was to, um, you know, reduce the dimensionality of this huge data and try to observe it from that perspective. 
Uh, another way that we've also started looking out in this collaboration is not from the image cube itself, but a processed version of it uh, called the OPD analysis, which also has, you know, shown some potential diagnostic capability. Um, I don't want to talk more about it, but please feel free to touch base later if you want to learn more about this. So, but I think the more important aspect of this collaboration has been um, in understanding the data itself, right? So if you could go to the next slide, I just like mentioned a couple of pointers that we really enjoyed in this collaboration. The most important thing of it is that you understand that there is this shared values within the whole community of AI. Huge, um, you know, there's a lot of learning that happens from these different people from different learning backgrounds. There's people from statistics, from physics, and there's everybody has like different perspectives to offer, which is very crucial when we're talking about this field of artificial intelligence, because everything counts. And that's where this interdisciplinary learning comes into picture. So um, personally, the team and I, uh, we have thoroughly enjoyed learning a lot from the whole WWT data scientists because of the whole brainstorming sessions that we've had um, in terms of understanding the problem, the different ways to look at it and different algorithms that we could possibly apply. And um, we were also really glad that they took the time and effort in helping us provide with the resources that we would need to solve this particular problem and also assisted at every step um, in you know, learning how to you know, set up those resources, trying to use those resources for our advantage. So um, I think really a big shout out to the whole team for helping us in this journey of ours. I tried to quickly end it. <laughs> that way there's time for the other slides, but um, yeah. Thank you. Hi guys, my name is Maggie and I'm an operations manager um, for the consulting services group, which really means I do everything around employee development, um, including recruiting, um, onboarding folks, training, performance management, all that good stuff. So, uh, you know, if you're, you're interested in learning more about a, what a consulting role looks like, um, you can definitely, obviously you guys have existing relationships here, but also reach out to me um, to learn more about our team Something that I like to highlight on this slide is really um, the benefits worldwide has definitely, as Jessica mentioned, a focus on individual development, um, rotating across lots of different industries, um, you know, help to grow your career. So it is uh, a fun place to work if um, you're interested in learning more now or in the future. And here's some examples of roles that we are hiring for. So lots of growth on our team, hiring across, you know, from management consulting to data science to digital, uh, lots of different types of work um, that we do and that we're looking to add great folks to. So I think, I don't know if you can see it right now, but my email is linked on this slide here. Um, so feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. I know we're right at time. Uh, ben, I don't know if you have any cl closing thoughts here. Uh, no, I think we can, if there's any questions, we can we can take any questions. Um, one, one note is that I did record this workshop. So um, I'll be uploading to our YouTube channel and um, I can make a link available to anybody who wants one, if you'd like to share it with friends, colleagues, et cetera. Yeah, and great to see everybody and definitely feel free to reach out to me um, for any sort of questions about worldwide data science, consulting. If you want to talk more about like devising AI, happy to chat. Great. Thank you, everybody. This was great. Hey, Good thanks for everybody for participating. Bye. Bye. Cheers all. Great rest of the week. Thank you. Bye, thanks. everyone. Take Bye. care.